Okay, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, this is the next part in our series that we're trying to focus on um, investing basics, financial planning basics, and also relating it a little bit to the unusual world that we're in right now. Uh, this is Quinn Arnold speaking, and then um, I will be turning this over shortly to Matt Hilland, uh, one of our financial planners and partners at the firm, and he'll be um, covering the majority of the topics today. I'm going to stay on in the background, though. If you have questions, you can certainly uh, message us directly in the chat function. You can also post a general question through chat to the whole group, um, but either way is fine. And I wanted to also let you uh, know that we'll stay on, Matt and I will stay on afterwards. If you have questions, we can either um, answer it here in the session or uh, do a, a direct phone call with you afterwards if it's uh, of a more particular um, client need. So uh, with that, I uh, just wanted to uh, kick off today by um, telling you that one of the things that we know uh, is a successful investing strategy for the long run is the use of bonds in our portfolios. But a lot of people don't know maybe the the basics of why we're doing that. And then also it, there have just been a number of questions in both the media and I think in our own minds as the stock market has really struggled in the last um, month or six weeks to understand like, okay, how does this all fit together? Especially when um, we know that interest rates in uh, as a whole have been falling and we're at a, a record low amount of uh, yield on bonds. And so um, with that, in the, some of those questions in the back of your head, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt um, and he's gonna cover a number of topics. Again, um, feel free to ask questions throughout. I'll be monitoring the chat um, or uh, stay on for afterwards. Okay, take it away, Matt. All right. Thank you. And thanks again for uh, joining us again on a Friday. We really enjoy doing this and enjoy um, reaching out to you guys. So thank you. Uh, before we get into too much detail on bonds, I just wanted to spend two minutes on the basics idea of what a bond is. So we're all on the same page before we get started. We use two different types of investments for clients. You have your stocks and you have your bonds. Both are ways that companies look to raise money and each has advantages and disadvantages for both the company and the investor. You've probably heard us say a hundred times about bonds being for safety and stocks being for growth, but why is that exactly? Why are returns different? Why is one asset class considered safer than the other? When you own stock in a company, you're an owner. You can get dividends if they pay, and you actually have the power, you can go to annual meetings and give management a piece of your mind. Um, I like going to the Berkshire Hathaway annual meetings in Omaha each year, which is Warren Buffett's company. And even here, me against Warren Buffett, as a shareholder, I'm allowed to get up and give Warren Buffett a piece of my mind if I really want to. I can let them know how I think they should run the company, right? And so as a shareholder, you have a very important role and historically that's produced very good returns. The primary goal of any business is to grow the value of the company and most of the time on average, that's what happens. But when things don't go as planned and businesses struggle, stocks get hit a lot harder uh, because there's very little legal claim to tangible uh, assets that equity owners get if a business goes bankrupt. Equity holders or shareholders usually end up with uh, you know, an amount very close to zero if the stocks that they hold go bankrupt. And that's where bonds come in as a safer asset. As a bond investor, you're under a legal contract to receive a payment from a company. And that's the interest or the coupon or the yield that a bond has that the company offers. And a bond is really just another way of saying a loan to the company. If the company does well, you do not receive any more money or more value like you would as a stockholder. But if the company does poorly, they must still pay you. And if they don't pay you, you have rights to make a claim for the assets of the company. That means you're entitled to your share of cash in the company's bank account, its property, its buildings, and all other assets it have is up for grabs for bondholders if the company does not pay. 
just as an example, over the last 40 years, uh, senior bondholders have had recovery rates of about 60%, meaning bondholders of a company, even if it's declared bankruptcy on average, get about 60% of their money back after the company's been liquidated or restructured. And obviously this is not a, a great scenario, but there's a big difference between losing 40% of your money and 100%. And this helps explain why bonds are usually considered a lot safer than equities. The last thing we wanna make sure uh, we understand before we kind of get going into the meat of this is the relationship of a bond's yield or its interest and its price. This will be important to understand as we talk about the future and expected returns of bonds later. When you buy a bond for a certain price, you get a yield or an interest rate, and that's an annual payment that the bond pays. So for example, if you buy a bond for $1,000 that has a 3% yield, you get $30 per year. But what happens if over time interest rates go up and new bonds get offered at 4%? If you're looking to sell your 3% bond, no one's going to want it because they can go and get a higher yield on another bond out there. So you'll have to sell it at a lower price so that $30 in interest you receive equates to about a 4% yield. In other words, the price of the bond must go down. And one last important note, this price movement is not as big of a concern for a long-term investor if you plan on holding the bond till maturity. Uh, the way most corporate bonds and treasury bonds work is that um, you put up an initial investment, over time you receive a small interest rate, and at the end you get your uh, complete investment back. So if you buy a bond at $1,000, uh, right when it's issued, you'll receive $1,000 when it matures. This change in price and yield occurs in the meantime, in between the bond being issued and when it matures. And so if you have to sell a bond before it matures, that's when you can see this um, decrease in the price of a bond. So this is only a concern for an investor if you have to sell your bond before it matures, but it is an issue um, for investors that are using a big portfolio of bonds to help fund a retirement, for example. And we'll get into that as one of the risks later. And so that was a very quick review of bonds. If you have any questions, please ask, but I wanted to get into the substance, you know, so we have some time to actually spend on that too. Uh, the term bond can mean many different things and they can be very different. Widely considered the safest investment is a U.S. Treasury bond. That's because the only way a Treasury bond does not get paid is if the U.S. government defaults. And since they control the printing press, that's considered to be pretty unlikely. And when it comes to our universe of bonds, we consider Treasuries the safest uh, asset. Then you can get more risky with other types of bonds from here. Municipal bonds are state and local government bonds. Uh, they can't print money like the federal government, but they still have the power to tax your property or sales or your income, which creates a pretty safe source of income to pay back bondholders. Corporate bonds are bonds issued from companies, think Apple or Microsoft, and the uh, Performance here for this line is for investment grade corporate bonds, which are bonds from companies that have been audited and deemed to have a very strong likelihood of paying back their bondholders. Just to give you a general idea, over uh, throughout history, less than 5% of investment grade bonds have been in default. And so while it's not risk free, it's a uh, you know, much lower risk than some of these other bonds such as high yield High yield bonds are also call, called junk bonds. These are from companies that have much worse financial strength. Uh, investors have flocked to them recently because they offer higher yields usually, you know, 8% or more, but they're risky and we'll see that in just a second. And lastly, the uh, convertible bonds are generally issued by companies that can't afford to pay higher interest rates. They're smaller startup companies and here, instead of offering a really high interest rate, 
they offer a stock component to the bonds payment also. So for example, Tesla is a big issue of issuer of these, you know, Tesla needs a lot of money to build factories. It's very capital intensive and they can't afford to pay 10% on bonds. Like, um, you know, the market would kind of ask them to. So instead they issue these convertible bonds that pay maybe one or 2% in interest, but then at some point in the future can be exchanged for stock in the company. And these create very high returns when the market goes up. So we see the returns for 2019 in the column here. Uh, treasuries, the safest asset, had a I'm much low. On had video, a much, I don't know how to do it though. Uh, treasuries had a much lower return than other riskier assets that we've seen. But things don't always go to plan like we've seen at the start of this year investors are forced to realize that some of these bonds that have given them higher returns now come with a cost. And so look at these. Imagine if you're retired and withdrawing money each month from your retirement. If that money was in high yield or convertible bonds because you wanted that higher interest rate, you've now seen a big reduction in the value of your investments. And Whereas treasuries or even municipal bonds and corporate bonds have not been down nearly as much. And so here you start to see why even with uh, lower returns in some years, treasuries have a very, treasuries and other safe bonds have a very important part of your uh, whole investment picture. Realize that even if these returns for treasuries were lower, say two or 3%, there's still tremendous value in these treasury bonds for times like today. Almost no other investment provides the guarantee that these treasury bonds can provide. So know that part of the value of these bonds in your portfolio is not so much the you know, interest payments or the returns that they kick out each month to you, but the ability for them to preserve your money when you really need it. Having an allocation to bonds today means that we're able to ride out the storm that we're seeing today, for example, and avoid selling investments that are temporarily down, but have a higher expected future return. And it also provides us good uh, ammunition for rebalancing purposes, which many of you have seen us do in your portfolios, where we can sell these bonds that have gone up in value and use that money to move into stocks uh, that are now at lower in value. And so that covered a lot about how different types of bonds have performed and why we prefer some bonds over others. Now we want to get into what produces the total return in the future for bondholders or how you would go about estimating what you can expect in the future from your bond holdings. And there's three main components that uh, all come together to produce what you would see as a total return over time. The first is yield or the interest rate on your bond. And this is pretty simple and straightforward. You buy a bond that pays a certain coupon or interest rate, and that's what you get over the life of the bond. If you buy a 3% bond, that payment is never going to be changed to 5% later. Uh, just for example, this is the portion of your return that you're kind of locked into. And for this component, expected future returns have been dropping. As you know, interest rates have been coming down for 40 years now. And this is the chart of a 10 year treasury bond yield over the last 150 years or so. And you, know, you can see it's been a roller coaster, but right now we're at uh, the lowest point in history. And right now a 10 year treasury bond will give you just under 1% per year. But there's more to your bond allocations return than just the rate on the 10 year treasury. Remember that there's also other types of bonds, corporates and municipal bonds, for example. And for our clients, you either own a fund with the ticker symbol DBIRX or SWAGX or SCHZ. And these are all funds that own uh, both treasuries, but also other types of bonds such as corporates and the expected returns on these bonds have gone up uh, much higher over the last month. And this is a chart of the spread or the difference in interest rates from investment grade corporate bonds 
to treasuries. And just for example, if the spread is 3%, that means an investment grade bond has a 3% higher interest rate than an equivalent uh, treasury bond. And notice that the spread has gotten much higher very recently. This means corporate bonds have now higher future interest and future yield compared to than just a few months ago. Now there's a cost to this, as we showed in the earlier slide, corporate bonds have lost about 4% in value so this year. So if you had $100,000 in corporate bonds to start the year, you're at now at about 96,000. But that drop is temporary because now that fund is buying these higher yielding bonds. You can see the spread now is uh, about 4%. And so the you know, investment grade corporate bonds now are getting close to 5% since the yield on a 10 year treasury is about 1%. And so for this portion of your bond investment that's in investment grade corporates, we've seen you know, expected returns are now much higher than they've been historically. And the last component is uh, duration. Duration is how long a bond stays outstanding until it's paid back. If a bond is to be paid back in five years, it has a shorter duration than a bond that's to be paid back in 10 years. And longer duration bonds typically have higher interest rates. Just like how a 30-year mortgage typically is a higher interest rate than a 15-year mortgage, that same principle applies most of the time to all other bonds. And economists plot out this increasing yield over different durations and create what's called a yield curve. This is just an example uh, shown below, but as you can see, shorter duration bonds typically have a lower yield than longer duration. The x-axis here is different durations. So say the yield on a one-year treasury bond is 1%, where a 30-year bond could be 2%. And the steepness of this yield curve tells us the last component of your bond investing return. Because remember in our early slide, we talked about how yields fall, then prices of the bonds rise. This yield curve helps clue us in into how a bond's value can rise over time. If you have a five-year treasury bond today, for example, over time as a couple of years go by, that five-year treasury begins to trade more like a three-year treasury. So know that from the yield curve at this time, a three-year treasury bond has a lower yield than a five-year. So as long as the yield curve remains unchanged over this couple of years, our five-year bond will increase in value since we're seeing yields drop. And the steepness or slant of this yield curve tells us how much a bond could rise in value. Now, this topic could be an hour-long webinar all by itself, so I'm really simplifying a few things here, but know that recently the steepness of this yield curve has become a lot higher for treasuries and especially for corporates and municipal bonds. And that's another component of your return that's um, kind of cluing us into higher returns over time. So those are the three main parts of a bond return that come together to produce your total return. But what are the risks to that return going forward? There are two primary risks, two primary risks that uh, we want to cover quickly, rising interest rates and inflation. And then we'll take a look at how we can hedge those risks for you. The first risk is rising interest rates. As we've said before, if interest rates rise, the value of your bond can go down. We show an example here on how the price of a bond can change as interest rates rise. If you have a 10-year bond and interest rates rise 1%, you could see the value in that bond drop by close to 10%. But we can hedge this risk away. Remember how we said this decline is only recognized if you need to sell the bond before it matures. If you hold the bond until maturity, you get your $1,000 back, not the reduced $925, for example. So where people get in trouble with fixed income investing is when they buy a bond with a much longer duration than what they need. If you are using a 30-year treasury bond for savings that you need next year, you subject yourself to a lot of this risk, where if you are using a one-year treasury bond for the savings that you need next year, you've completely removed this risk. 
So we can match the bond duration of your, or the duration of your bond investments to meet your, uh, the timeline of your needs. And for many retirees, this means owning at least a portion of shorter duration bonds, since that bond investment is there to protect your money for short term needs. The next big risk is inflation. Uh, you, when you buy a bond, you're locking yourself into a fixed return over time. And because inflation kind of eats away at that uh, purchasing power of that return each year, you see your real return or your inflation adjusted return on that bond decrease over time. And this chart just shows an example of uh, what the interest rates would be on a bond with two and a half percent inflation. And so over time, you know, the purchasing power of that uh, fixed interest rate declines by, you know, roughly a third. And again, this is another um, risk that we can uh, hedge away for you. We can reduce duration so you aren't locked into a very long-term bond where if inflation does rise in the future, you're stuck holding these lower yielding bonds today. We can diversify by adding other types of bonds. You know, we showed how corporate bonds are rise, corporate bond yields are rising. And then we can also add inflation protection if we need to. Uh, right now, inflation is not a risk. It's been non-existent for a few years, but there are uh, investments such as TIPS, which are treasury bonds that are indexed to inflation to ensure that over time their purchasing power keeps up with inflation. And so there are ways we can uh, hedge away this risk also. The last thing we wanted to talk about was uh, a big fear that investors have today about how these rising, potentially rising interest rates in the future will impact their bond investments and make their bond investments potentially lose value. So I wanted to end on a slide that shows the returns that investors have had during the last period we saw that had significantly rising interest rates. This is a look at that same chart on a previous slide, the 10-year treasury interest rate over time. And until this last dip very recently, interest rates were, you know, what we would all consider very low, but almost exactly where they were in the 40s and 50s. And of course, the 70s and 80s saw a rapid rise in interest rates. And so I thought it'd be interesting to look at the returns that an investor in 10-year treasury bonds would have received over those few decades from the 40s up until um, you know, the early 80s when inflation and interest rates kind of peaked. And I put those results by decade here. This is total returns over a 10-year period. And notice these are not stellar returns by any means, but even in a significantly rising interest rate environment, uh, treasury bonds did a very good job of producing a return, but most importantly, protecting an investor's capital. And so, you know, we would, I think any fixed income investor would kind of consider a 1970s or 1980s scenario, the worst case scenario. And we've seen that happen in the past, and these bonds still provided a very important uh, piece in the investor's portfolio. And so with that, just wanted to finish up with a couple takeaways. The first is that we keep bonds in your portfolio for capital preservation. They're there for times like today when we need an investment that we can depend on to be a stable source of value. They're not there as a driver for growth. And when investors try to change up their bond investments by using you know, high yield bonds and convertible bonds, it can work and it works until it doesn't, until a time like today. And so we take risks on the equity side of your portfolio and the bonds are there to uh, preserve that capital and preserve your savings. So it's there when you need it. And we use a mix of different types of bonds, just like how we diversify our stocks between large and small and international and emerging markets. We can do the same with your bonds to help reduce the risk of, you know, the low interest rates for U.S. Treasuries, for example, or the rising interest rates in one country or credit 
quality in certain bonds. Owning a diversified mix of bonds is going to be very important going forward to uh, help reduce any risks. And of course, all investing involves risk. Bond risk is there, uh, but it's very manageable. And so you'll see how we um, invest our clients in bonds. You have a portion that's usually a shorter term, and that's there to um, you know, protect you in pr protect your investments over the short term. And then you have some mix of other bonds, uh, corporates and things like that to try to get a little bit more of a return, but in the asset that's still relatively safe. And that's all I had prepared for today. Thanks for uh, sticking around and listening. And if you have any questions, or please let us know.